In this unit, we're going to talk about the overall hack computer architecture, and we're going to give you all the information which is needed in, or in order to actually go out and build it. So here we see the overall uh, hardware architecture of the hack computer, and we see that we have something new here. Uh, we have uh, two uh, fancy input-output devices. In particular, we have a, a raster uh, display uh, unit that enables us to take values from the computers and actually display them in some sensible way that makes sense to humans. And we also have uh, a keyboard unit that will enable us to interact with a program that currently runs in the computer, uh, assuming, of course, that this program accepts us to, uh, to enter some values uh, into it. So this is how the computer looks like. And as usual, it pays off to think about the abstraction. So from the user's perspective or from the programmer's perspective, we have some sort of a black box uh, magic or a computer that enables us to, write, to run on it programs written in the hack machine language. Now, this is uh, not to be taken lightly because if, for example, we will write uh, a Java compiler that uh, translates from Java to hack machine language, well, this computer will be able to run Java programs. And in fact, this is something that uh, 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 we do something very similar to this in the second part of the course, uh, which we will describe uh, at the end of this course. So abstractly, we have a general purpose computer that can run any program that can be translated into hack uh, native code. So this is the top-down description uh, or abstraction of this computer. We can also describe this computer bottom-up. How do we build this computer? Well, it turns out that we can build this computer using some of the chips that we built uh, previously in this course that actually you built. And all we have to do is put them together in some judicious way and we'll get an architecture that enables us uh, to realize the abstraction that we just described. So once again, this is the overall architecture. And uh, what we'll do in this unit is focus on every one of these uh, three pieces and describe, first of all, what it does. And second of all, how, can actually, how we can actually uh, build it. Let us start with the CPU, which is the centerpiece of the architecture. And I don't want to talk too much about the CPU because I just spent uh, uh, about 20 minutes talking about it in the previous unit. So I'd like to kind of gloss over uh, what the CPU is supposed to do in the overall uh, hardware architecture. Here is the interface that we've seen in the previous unit. And let us explore this interface in the context of three possible uh, hack instructions. How will the CPU, or how does the CPU supposed to do to deal with these uh, instructions? Well, uh, everything is being done according to hack uh, language uh, specification uh, contract, uh, if you will. So if the instruction mentions the mnemonics DNA, the CPU is going to manipulate the respective DNA registers which reside inside the CPU. If the instruction is an A instruction, well, in this case, the uh, CPU is going to take the data value, the 15-bit uh, uh, so-called X in this instruction, and it is going to put them uh, inside the A register. If the right-hand side of the instruction mentions the mnemonic M, then the CPU expects to see this value or some data value in the in M input of the CPU interface. That is, this input is supposed to contain the value of the currently selected data memory register. And if the instructions left-hand side contains uh, the mnemonic M as one of the destinations of the operation, and we see it in the last example here, in the third uh, uh, instruction in the slide. So if this is the case, then the ALU output should be stored in the uh, main memory. In this case, we discussed it before, we have to provide three different uh, uh, pieces of data, the value that we want to store, uh, the address where we want to store it, and the control bit. So this is done by the CPU in the way that was discussed in the previous unit. Moving along, let's see how the CPU handles jumps. So once again, we have a typical uh, uh, jump uh, situation. Uh, the A register already includes uh, the address 100. We, we assume that this is the case. And now we have uh, a conditional jump. D equals D minus 1. 
and if the result of this operation or the ALU output is uh, zero, we want to jump. Jump where? To the address uh, uh, that was specified before, to 100. How do we do it? Well, if reset equals zero, which is normally the case when a program is running, reset equals zero because the user doesn't touch uh, the reset button, then the CPU logic uses the jump bits and the ALU output to decide whether or not uh, there should be a jump. If there is a jump, PC is set to the value of the A register. If there's no jump, PC is incremented. And the updated PC value is emitted by the PC output of the CPU. If reset equals one, it means that the user wants to reset uh, and rerun the program from the beginning. So in this case, PC is set to zero, and that's the end of the story. So this, in a nutshell, is the contract according to which the CPU is supposed to operate in the overall computer architecture. Moving along, let us discuss the data memory. The data memory, if you recall, is the area in which we uh, store all the data of the program, and, uh, and here is how we do it. Well, if we think about this data memory from a programmer's perspective, uh, it's convenient to think about it in terms of three different segments, or logical segments, if you will. Addresses 0 up to 16K are used to store the data that the program generates and manipulates. The next 8K of the memory are used to store the screen memory map. If you want to draw something on, on the screen, you have to manipulate bits uh, in this memory segment. And finally, the last register in the memory is used to reflect uh, or to tell us which key is currently being pressed on the keyboard. Now, once again, this is an abstraction, right? This is how the programmer expects uh, this, uh, this memory to, to operate. And now, let us turn to discuss how we actually make it happen. Well, we do it by building the memory from three different uh, sub-chips, if you will, or chip parts, as we call it in our uh, HDL uh, jargon. So the first segment is just a standard RAM chip. The next segment is uh, uh, a special chip uh, called uh, screen. And the last segment is yet another special chip, which we call keyboard. And in the next few minutes, I want to say a few words about every one of these uh, chip parts. So let us start with the RAM. The RAM is trivial. We've built it in, uh, in uh, Project uh, 3, I believe. One of the chips that you built was called RAM 16. So we just plug it in, and this gives us the, uh, the necessary uh, um, implementation. And notice that the inputs and outputs of the RAM 16 are identical to the inputs and outputs of the overall uh, memory chip. So whoever builds this chip has to make sure to take the outside uh, inputs and outputs, so, so to speak, and connect them uh, uh, and make the connections that will funnel these values into the inner chip parts, into the RAM, uh, RAM 16K uh, chip part. Moving along, the next segment in the memory, if you recall, uh, is called screen. And before we talk about the implementation of this uh, uh, memory segment, let us remind ourselves uh, what we mean when we say memory map. Now, we discussed it at length when we talked about hack programming. So I'm not going to repeat it. I will just uh, gloss over the main ideas. So we assume that we have uh, a display unit consisting of uh, so many rows and so many columns. It's a black and white uh, uh, display device. Uh, we assume that we have an area in the memory that controls this unit so that when we change, uh, when we change bits in this uh, uh, special uh, uh, memory, memory uh, area, uh, the architecture refreshes the screen accordingly. And this refresh happens several times uh, each, uh, each second. Now, there's also a mapping that uh, tells us how to relate coordinates of pixels uh, on the uh, display unit with specific bits in the, uh, in the memory map. And uh, once again, we discussed this before. You're more than welcome to stop the video and uh, make sure that this mapping uh, makes sense. And this is how the memory map is uh, specified and uh, uh, designed in the context of the hack computer. So how do we implement it? Well, we use a special built-in screen chip 
that knows how to automatically, quote unquote, refresh a connected display unit. Now, I want you to notice that in the most part, there's nothing special about this chip. It's just a regular RAM chip. However, it has this nice side effect of refreshing uh, um, a connected uh, display unit. So this is the chip that we are going to use in order to implement uh, the memory, I'm sorry, the, uh, the display effect of our computer. Moving along, what about the keyboard? Well, the keyboard is implemented with a single register, a 16-bit register, which we call keyboard. And this register is connected to a standard keyboard, similar to the one that you are currently using. And we discussed it, uh, once again, we discussed it in, uh, in week four. Uh, how do we handle inputs? Well, if we don't touch the keyboard, the keyboard uh, register is going to emit the value zero, or and it's going to contain the value zero. If we take our finger and touch or press one of these keys, uh, the scan code of this key is going to be stored inside the keyboard register. So for example, if we press K, it turns out that the scan code of K is 107, and 107, 107 is going to appear in binary in this register. So as long as our finger is down, we'll see uh, 1101011. Once we take the finger uh, uh, away, it will show zero. Likewise, if we uh, click something else, the number four, turns out that the scan code of four is 52. We will see this value. If we click space, we'll see 33. If we click uh, up arrow, we'll see something else. So that's the deal. That's how the, uh, uh, the keyboard operates. And what we see in the keyboard is called, or we usually call it, the keyboard memory map. How do we implement it? Well, once again, we use a special uh, chip which uh, 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 is connected to the keyboard. And as I said before, I want to repeat it now, there's nothing special about this chip. It's a regular register that has a nice side effect. And the side effect is it always reflects what the user is pressing on the keyboard. And most of the time it's zero because most of the time the keyboard is not used. All right, um, how do we uh, read the keyboard? Well, we talked about it in, uh, in week four. Uh, to read the keyboard, we simply probe the output of the keyboard register, right? We see that the keyboard register has an internal state that we don't see in this uh, diagram here, but it also has an output uh, 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 pin, just like any regular register. So we can, we can read what comes out from the keyboard, and from this information, we know uh, which key is currently pressed. But if we use the keyboard in the overall context of the hack memory, we have to probe the contents of memory register 24 uh, or 24,576 because this happens to be the address uh, of the keyboard uh, interface or the keyboard uh, memory map within the overall address space of the memory unit. Okay, so uh, we know how to handle uh, how to uh, uh, handle and uh, uh, build roughly the CPU. We know how to implement the uh, memory. We're going back to uh, the overall computer architecture. And uh, I've added uh, something little to this architecture. And this is the uh, reset button. I want to remind you that if we actually set out to build this computer, we are going to have a black box with a reset button. And this reset button corresponds in my diagram to this uh, orange uh, reset uh, oval that you see in front of you. And we're going to refer to this uh, reset um, uh, in the remaining uh, slides in this unit. Okay, so with that in mind, the next thing that we want to uh, implement is the instruction memory of the HEC uh, computer system. And we implement this instruction memory using uh, a, a chip which we call ROM32K. Let us assume that we have this computer sitting on the table and next to this computer we have a program written in the HEC uh, uh, machine language. In order to run this program, the first thing that we have to do is somehow load it into the computer, right? So we load it into the computer, and in particular, we load it into the ROM32K uh, chip. 
we press the reset button that we just discussed and the program will start running. This is the abstraction that we want to implement. Now, I'm sure that many of you are stretching your head and saying, well, how do you actually get a program which resides on a piece of paper or in some text file and put it inside the computer? Well, it turns out that there are several ways to do it. Uh, one of them is to use plug-and-play ROM chips. So uh, we burn our code, the machine instruction code, into a RAM chip. We take this RAM chip, we plug it into the computer, we press the reset button, and the computer will start executing this, uh, uh, this particular program. If we want to run another program, we take this chip out and we plug in another ROM chip that has another program burnt into it. And this is actually quite similar to the way some game consoles uh, operate. You have some cartridges with games that you plug in. You play a certain game, you want to play another game, you, you plug in another cartridge, and so on. So that's one way to, to implement it. Another way to implement it is using hardware simulation. And that's what, we, uh, what we're going to do in, in this course. We use a hardware simulator. If we use a hardware simulator, we have the freedom to do many different things, and indeed, we are going to use a built-in ROM chip that actually, once again, there's nothing special about it because it operates very similarly to a RAM chip that you built in, in uh, uh, Project 3, but it has a nice side effect that it allows you, using simulation, to load programs into it, uh, 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 residing programs that are residing on regular text files. And let me take a minute uh, and... Uh, and illustrate how this is actually being done in our hardware simulator. Welcome to the Heck CPU Emulator. The CPU Emulator is a Java program that gives you a visual rendition of what is happening inside the Heck computer when a program is being executed. And indeed, if you look around, you will see all sorts of familiar elements from the Heck platform. On the left-hand side, we see the uh, instruction memory, and right next to it, the data memory. And below, we see the current value of the A register here, and the current value of the D register there. And there's also a visual rendition of the ALU operation. Another uh, control of interest is this one, which shows you the current value of the so-called program counter. The program counter is a register that contains the address of the instruction that will be executed next in the uh, program which is currently loaded into the instruction memory. Now, right now, we have no program in the instruction memory, so let's go ahead and load one. So I click this control here, and um, I have this uh, folder called Program Examples, so I'm going to uh, select it. And inside program examples, there are all sorts of uh, uh, hack programs. I'm going to select the first one, Ed2, and click the Load ROM button. And I see that uh, now the instruction memory contains what seems to be uh, a sequence of hack uh, machine instructions written in assembly. <clears throat> I'm sorry, written in assembly language. Now, if I want, I can look at these uh, instructions in uh, binary format. And yet, um, as we argued before, it's much easier to uh, think about the, the program and display it and understand it when it's uh, uh, visualized using uh, these assembly commands. Now, according to the rules of the game, or more precisely, according to the rules of this program, in order to run it, we first have to enter some numbers into the RAM. So uh, let's see. I'm going to enter, let's say, 12 here and uh, 7 there. These are completely arbitrary uh, values, and hopefully the program will end up summing up these two values and putting the result in RAM2. So um, to check that this is actually the case, I can begin running the program, and I do it by using this uh, uh, visual metaphor here of um, um, an advanced uh, sort of VCR control. So let's, let's advance and execute the first instruction. Well, nothing dramatic happened. Uh, let us uh, execute the next instruction. And I see that the D register became 12. So we managed to load 
um, the uh, contents of RAM0 into the D register. Moving along, I now execute the next instruction, which was at 1, and indeed I see that the value of the A register is now 1. Let's do the first uh, instruction, uh, D equals D plus M, and indeed we see that the current value of D became 19, which is 12 plus 7. And finally, we execute at 2, which selects uh, uh, this, this uh, register here in the RAM, register number 2, I see it uh, here as well. And finally, M equals D, and indeed we see that uh, RAM 2 became uh, 19. So lo and behold, it looks like the program is actually working. Now notice that the program counter is 6, so if I uh, keep on executing commands, uh, I will continue to execute uh, whatever resides here in memory in all these addresses, which um, is uh, a little bit worrisome, and I will uh, get uh, get back to talk about it a little bit uh, later on. All right, now let us uh, suppose that we want to rerun this program from scratch, so what we can do is rewind the program, so to speak. Now, there is no rewind in, in computers, um, but this visual metaphor here indicates that the program counter has been set to zero, and this actually causes uh, the computer to uh, to set itself to a position in which it can start executing this program again. So we can, you know, try some other values here. Let's let's enter just uh, uh, the first value uh, is now minus five, and I'm going to rewind once again, and now I'm going to fast forward, which actually means just you know let the whole program execute um, uh, automatically, so to speak. So we see that the program is indeed executing without any help from us. And uh, let us uh, pause it for a little while, and we see that uh, we got the right answer, which is 2. Minus uh, 5 plus 7 is 2. And if we continue to execute it, uh, the computer will kind of spin its wheels, so to speak, and will execute all these uh, null instructions. And indeed, we see that uh, nothing is actually happening, but uh, the program is kind of out of control, and we have to think about way to resolve it. But for now, what is more interesting is the fact that uh, we learned how to execute a program and how to inspect the various controls here and convince ourselves that the program is actually doing what it's supposed to do. So now that we understand how the ROM comes to play in uh, simulation, let's go back to the general uh, specification of the ROM. Um, it's uh, uh, almost a regular memory chip. It has an address coming in. It has some output coming out. It's a ROM device, read-only, so we don't have any machinery that enables uh, uh, writing into it. And uh, if you recall, the output of, uh, of the ROM is always the contents of the register that is selected by the address input. So if I enter 17 into the address input, what will come out is the contents of register number 17. So it makes a lot of sense to take this ROM and connect it to the program counter, because the program counter always emits the address of the next instruction. So if we feed this address into the ROM, we are guaranteed that the ROM will always emit uh, a 16-bit value that we can treat as the current instruction. And if the PC is doing what it's supposed to do, then in every cycle, the PC will provide the address of the next uh, instruction that we want to uh, execute. And this is after taking into consideration all the go-tos and the conditional go-tos and, and so on. And what will come out from the ROM is always the current instruction that we want to execute as if by magic. Of course, we know that there's nothing magical here because we're going to build everything, uh, uh, all of this uh, ourselves. So having said that, we can now finally wrap up this uh, uh, discussion and talk about how we build the overall computer architecture. Okay, so we start with the CPU, and as was just discussed, we connect to it the instruction memory, which we call ROM. And we connect it in exactly the same manner that we just discussed. So uh, the instruction input of the CPU 
is taken from the output of the instruction memory. And so we have a current instruction to operate on. And in the process of executing this instruction, we are going to compute the address of the next instruction that has to be fetched. And this address is going to, emitted, is going to be emitted by the program counter. And it goes all the way into the address of the instruction unit, of the instruction memory unit. And uh, this unit, in turn, will then emit the next instruction that has to be uh, executed in the next cycle. Now, the CPU in this uh, sub-diagram here is kind of spinning its wheels, and nothing, nothing is actually being done with its, with its outputs. So in order to do something useful with the outputs of the CPU, we connect them to the memory unit according to the contract that we described several times, uh, what we want to write, where we want to write it, and the uh, uh, load bit. And finally, we take the output of the memory and we connect it back into uh, the CPU because many instructions uh, will want to operate on the memory and not only write into it. And this is all. This is our computer architecture. All we have to add now is the overall interface of the architecture and the uh, uh, output and input uh, units. And we see that the only thing that the user uh, of this computer sees when he works with this computer is the display unit, the keyboard, and the reset button. And this, once again, uh, wraps up uh, everything that we want to say about uh, uh, building this uh, computer architecture. And when I look at this ar architecture and reflect back on everything that uh, uh, we did so far, I'm reminded by this uh, uh, quote about what it means to be uh, beautiful. We ascribe beauty to that which is simple, which has no superfluous parts, which exactly answers its end, which stands related to all things, which is the mean of many extremes. This was said uh, 120 years ago by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I hope that uh, you too agree with me that uh, the hack computer is, uh, is beautiful according to this uh, standard. And one reason why it is so aesthetic is because it's incredibly simple. You know, all you have to do in order to build this uh, uh, computer here, provided that you built uh, these uh, three chips, is write something like three lines of HDL code, which is quite remarkable. And so this exactly is going, what we're going to do in the next unit. Now that we describe the overall architecture, we will show you how to actually build these uh, three chips, put them together, and have a hack computer that you can actually use to run every program that comes to your mind.